Welcome. Thank you all for coming out to the Whalen Library. We're very excited tonight to have Aurelia's Garden here. Uh, we get to hear Hannah Tragus, the founder, president, and agricultural director of Aurelia's Garden. She's grown every type of vegetable there is and then some. She has an MS in plant physiology and worked as senior horticulturalist at the Mass Horticultural Society at Elm Bank. She currently works at Terrascapes Landscape Design as a fine gardening division manager. We also have Loring Schwartz, who is a, a board member and the fa a founding member. She's been devoted to conservation and climate change policy since the 1970s. She holds degrees from Tufts and Yale School of the Environment and currently serves as Senior Principal Master Gardener and is co-chair of the Cons Conservation Advisory Council for the Mass Land Trust Coalition. She's also active in the Sudbury Garden Club. So I want to thank Hannah and Loring for being here tonight and let you know that we are also recording this. Um, so you'll be able to rewatch on the library's YouTube page and share it with your friends. We'll also hopefully be on Waycam, our local cable access station. And I think Hannah and Loring plan to speak for about 45, 50 minutes, and then we'll have some time for questions. So write them down, or if you're on Zoom, feel free to put your questions in the chat at any time, and then when we get to the q and I'll raise my hand and read them aloud. So now I'll get out of the way. Thank you. Hi, everybody. Great to see you all here, and great to have people online as well. Um, I am going. Uh, provide some context and background to our project. Maybe I'll provide the who, uh, when, where, whereas Hannah will go deeply into what we're doing on site. I think so. Um, so, and, and our project to address food insecurity and ecological farming locally. Okay, here's our mission which you can read as well as I can. Um, we're basically been working together for eight years, some of us. Uh, we have been working at Aurelia's Garden for five years. We met, most of us, at Mass Horticultural Society where Hannah was director of horticulture and where she mentored us. Some of us were master gardeners and some just dedicated gardeners there. Uh, so we have known one another for a while. Uh, Hannah is amazing at leading this horticultural project, and I think you'll realize that once you speak. Um, during the pandemic, early days of the pandemic, we wanted to have a higher impact on um, food insecurity than we had at the gardens at Mass Horticultural, where we had a seed-to-table garden which grew food for local food. Um, so we set about 19 and early 2020 to establish a bigger project that would have more impact. We're also very interested in ecological farming practices. So marrying those two things is important to us. Okay, so the nutshell, we knew we wanted to uh, find uh, a nonprofit organization so that we could accept donations and uh, have that nonprofit status. Uh, we knew we were we led and managed, and we knew that we wanted a hundred a hundred percent of our produce to go to people in need. So 100%, just right off the bat, 100% of what we do is donated. We don't take any home with us, uh, which is tempting sometimes, but we don't. Uh, we were able to find two sites, uh, pr um, one on private land, which is Mike Patterson's field, and Mike Patterson is here, and we are we praise him every day we get back out on his field because it's an amazing piece of property and um, it's not easy to find people who will let you farm their land. Basically, it's private land. Um, and we also have a piece of land in Medway that um, is farmed as well and it contributes to the food that we, can, we bring to the food pantries. Um, so we worked also in those early days with um, the uh, food pantries 
wasn't easy because during the pandemic, you know how you treated your food very carefully, right? Uh, so we had a very interesting few, few years of setting up and uh, getting established. that over the long run we want to offer assistance uh, and resource to, uh, resources to other projects like ours, and we were able to do that in our early days and continue to do that now. Okay, um, this is our incremental growth in a nutshell, and you don't see 2020 there, but we actually did a lot of work in 2020. <laughs> um, finding the land um, and organizing and grand planning on how we would improve the soil on the site to grow what we wanted to grow, uh, developing the infrastructure on the site, which Hannah will talk about more um, in, a, in a bit. Uh, if you look at the numbers, you can see that we pretty much have had a consistent number of volunteers since the beginning. 50 plus volunteers every year who, who donate quite a bit of time to, to everything involved on the site. Um, but you can, and the acreage that we've farmed is pretty much the same. 2023. But if you look at the pounds of food that we've donated, it's increased dramatically. Um, we've, we've scaled a little bit this year because of some of the climate problems have been uh, uh, scourged throughout Massachusetts, basically too much water. We're increasing the production on the same piece of land through ecological farming. So uh, you can see the numbers of households served in just three years. Okay, just a brief bit about food insecurity in Massachusetts. Um, it was, uh, this is one of the things that really got us going in the first place. And we were reading that 19 plus percent of families with children were food insecure in Massachusetts. And be honest with you, it hasn't changed much. I mean, we had some food programs that were established during the pandemic, but that funding has pretty much gone away. And inflation has kept the numbers up very high in Massachusetts. So we're motivated to keep on going, even though the pandemic is, you know, at this point behind us. Uh, complicating food access in our region uh, is farmland loss. Uh, much of Massachusetts farmland is unprotected, and I think only 4% of land in Massachusetts is actually farmland. So we really have to protect what we've got um, in terms of being more self-reliant on growing food in this state. Okay. Um, actually, there are some good, that's our field from up high. <laughs> it's kind of exciting. Hannah found that aerial photo. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, end of year two, yes, that's right. That's right, it doesn't, it looks even better now. Yeah, yeah, that, that farm bill is, the local, the Massachusetts Farm Bill is what we're talking about, and it does provide a lot of incentives, funding for buying farmland. So there are some hopeful things at the state level. Um, some of these farmland protection tools are echoed in the climate bill, the adaptation bill, uh, resiliency plan at the state level. So I think there are a lot of initiatives that are coming together to protect farmland and forests throughout the Commonwealth for, you know, humans and to address climate change and all of that. Also, of course, there are towns and nonprofit organizations and who are protecting farmland as well. It's not incentivized by the state. 
Okay, this is an interesting um, uh, couple of slides about the history, uh, historic presence of farming and particularly generally where our farm is in Wayland, that yellow circle. I mean, these are old maps, like 1600, 1700, and that's Wayland. And you can see in the first map that, you know, really undeveloped big swath of what was probably farmland, because this was a farmland, farming town. Uh, and then, you know, little by little uh, development around the edges, but that the place where, I guess it's right up, round up here, yeah. um, is uh, still, still um, in good shape and being farmed. It's prob possible that this farm has been in production for, you know, two, three hundred years. So um, we're carrying on a tradition as uh, Mainstone, Lee, uh, Water, what, Watertown Dairy, there are a number of big farms in Wayland that have a long history and, and this particular ar area of Wayland is part of it. I would encourage you to uh, check out the uh, Wayland Historic Society website, which has a wonderful slideshow um, presentation that was recorded by Bob, uh, um, who was, uh, he grew up in Wayland in a farming family, and he has a presentation that these slides came from, so we thank him for that. It's called, If You Ate Today, Thank a Farmer. So <laughs> I encourage you to check that out. Um, so let's see. So this is, the again, the general location, and it's, I put this in just because, you know, this is your town, it is kind of looking now. Uh, these are topo maps, and uh, they, you know, some of these go back. They they are certainly aren't up to date, but you can see the there's a nice mosaic of wetlands and watercourses and rolling hills. Um, these are good productive soils. These glacial soils are. Uh, productive and there's a lot of water resources to encourage farming spot. Uh, okay. <sighs> the need for resilient lands. Um, we need a different way to relate to the land now that uh, we addressing are addressing the impacts of droughts and floods and heat waves and all those sorts of things that happen in climate change. Um, there are farmers who are trying to mitigate entire crop losses very early in the season, like in this past year, 2023, we had a horrendous amount of rain in the early part of the season and some people lost their entire crops. So we basically can't crop tr as traditionally as we used to. We need a new way of looking at how to relate to the and, and this is, a, we have a new way, I mean, there's a new farming approach these days. It's called agro, um, agroecology, agro, agroecological farming, and it improves soil health. It um, increases yields, it lowers costs, it really focuses on the soils and the soil's ability to hold nutrients, the soil's ability to support plant life, the soil's ability to hold water. And um, a lot of what we do on the field is this um, resilient farming. It enhances biodiversity. It's just a great approach. Okay, to Patterson Field. Um, we're in this area and um, up near Upper, Upper Mill Brook. So we've got private neighbors, we've got the town of Wayland as a neighbor, and um, we are in a matrix of uh, interesting land ownership, and it's v very complimentary. Um, the, yeah, SVT Upper Mill Brook is right there. If you've been there, it, it's been occupied for a long time. There's a lot of relict dams and reservoirs and things, ponds, things like that. But the wildlife there really is remarkable and interesting. And uh, what we do, I think, is um, complementary to that. Um, we really feel like um, it's a gift to be on this parcel when we're out there. 
Uh, I'm going to show you now just a some slides of what it looks like to be there. Um, we have a lot of a lot of interesting wildlife, and we try to support everything that we have there. We don't we practice no-till harvesting or, or, or agriculture, so we're not uh, messing up the soil and uh, no pesticides. Uh, very limited and targeted um, applications to the roots. Uh, invasive control, uh, water resource conservation is a big thing. We take very little water out of the stream we're authorized to, or we can, but we don't. Um, and uh, so it's, it's a uh, good way to farm. Lots of birds, lots of wildlife. Um, you know, it's funny because agriculture used to have a love-hate relationship with birds <laughs> because birds would eat a lot of the crop and all of that. But recent research shows that uh, when there are natural areas nearby, this is one of the interesting things, agriculture and natural area protection used to be at odds because there were so many chemicals used, so many pesticides used. But now, if, if it's done in an ecological way, farming and natural systems can enhance the health of, of one another. And it's, this is the case in birds. Birds will come, they'll peck off some, some insects that are not necessarily good, go back and feed the nutritious foods from the forest. So we're happy to be part of that par partnership. Um, I should mention that all of these bird houses were built by one of our Smith. And again, just more wildlife, um, our herpetolo herpetological and amphibian friends. We've got a lot of different types of frogs and turtles near us. And when they wander off, we bring them back <laughs> and respect their nesting sites. Plant, we have a lot of plant assistance. Pollinators, of course, are important for growing vegetables and uh, setting fruits. Uh, a lot of... Uh, insects which are in rapid decline across the globe so we really try to uh, increase the amount of natural habitat natural plants that are around to support them and with that i'm going to anna to go deeper take a deeper dive Thank you, Lauren. That was that was amazing. And agroecology is at the heart of of everything we do. And um, so I want to take you through the organization itself, how the work that we did to found the organization, as well as um, found a farming site with um, an auxiliary site down in in Medway. Uh, so. <laughs> One thing I want to tell you is one of the first things that, that we did is we identified the things we valued most about um, being able to grow food and being able to um, work outdoors, being able to feed and support our community. Um, so we really brainstormed very hard about our collective set of values. And those values have guided us through um, a, most of our decision, all of our decision making. Um, so in the first year, we were uh, very busy, as um, Loring touched on earlier, but uh, throughout the winter before the pandemic even had, had started in 2020, there was a group of us who were meeting um, several times a week and was actually looking at uh, old text threads the other night <laughs> from uh, February of 2020, and uh, just, did you check on this? Did you do this? What's your checklist? Have you have you done your research on this topic yet? Um, we did know from the beginning that we wanted the autonomy of being a nonprofit organization. We had briefly explored what it would mean to be um, an entity that had a parent fiscal partner and we decided we did not want anyone else controlling our decision making uh, because we were um, very committed to adhering to our values as we move forward. So the search for farmland was happening at the same time we were going through all the steps it takes to 
form a corporation and then take that corporation and apply for nonprofit status. So we were um, dealing with lawyers. We were creating bylaws. We were engaging with accountants and other nonprofit farms that grow food for food pantries. Um, we were doing strategic planning. We were having um, facilitated discussions, uh, visioning and creating that mission statement that you saw earlier in the presentation. Uh, we were applying for um, incorporation <laughs> papers. Uh, and at the, the same time, we were um, trying to find land. And uh, the most exciting thing was we we thought we were going to farm on a piece of land uh, at the Sudbury Valley Trustees. And it was a beautiful piece of land, but it was mostly wetland. And Mike <laughs> um, had come out to meet us um, that day. And he said, well, you know, I have a piece of land too. <laughs> So he took us over to see uh, his property, and I, I do want to stress that it is private property, and our closest neighbor uh, is a private landowner, so I do not encourage anyone to try to come out and find the property yourself. If you would like to see what we do at the farm, please sign up and volunteer with us and, and help us out, but I, I do want to make that point as often as I can. <laughs> um, I can advance some of the slides. So these were some of the challenges that, that we identified. Um, we had to incorporate, we had to secure land. Once we secured land, um, we realized that it had not been farmed in a little while. And when it had been farmed, um, a lot of mechanical uh, tools were used, a tractor was used regularly. Uh, and so there was a lot of soil degradation, but it was still beautifully productive. Um, there was a gorgeous stand of winter rye cover crop on it. So it was just this magical, magical place from the beginning. Um, so, incorporation. <laughs> Aurelia's garden is born. Um, Aurelia, everyone asks why Aurelia's garden. Aurelia was a mascot animal that spent a summer with the seed to table crew at Massachusetts Horticultural Society. And we all viewed her as a good luck symbol, as is common in, in many cultures that revere this animal. And we named her Aurelia after a variety of basil that we were growing, because <laughs> it was a beautiful name. But this animal lived with us the entire summer. She actually lived on my golf cart in a garden that I had a little window box on the front of my golf cart. February 20th, 2020, I had gone out to, um, would already made an agreement with Mike to use the land and had gone out to take another look and I found a praying mantis egg case. And I had texted that picture back to the group and somebody said, Aurelia's farm. <laughs> so, um, but yes, there was uh, all sorts of intellectual work that, that we were doing. And um, as I said, as the pandemic sat in, our meetings went from in person to figuring out how to Zoom call with each other um, once or twice a week. And these meetings went for, for several hours. Um, we did self-fund. Our, that first year, we had about maybe $7,000 worth of costs that we incurred. Um, and we got our incorporation papers and our nonprofit status in July of 2020. That was a huge celebration. Um, July of 2020 was also when we were able to make our first delivery to the Open Table Food Pantry in Maynard. So there were a lot of activities happening concurrently. <laughs> Um, that, that came to pass. Uh, as we went into the fall that year, we launched our first annual appeal. We were very grown up. We um, <laughs> made an annual appeal letter and we sent it out and people donated. Um, we showed them how hard we had worked and what we were able uh, to do that year and we promised that we would do more the next year. And we have been very, very hard ever since then to, to deliver on all of the goals and promises that, that we make. We're very careful not to make promises that we don't think we can deliver on. So we have to be strategic with those. 
So as our values, we strive to be inclusive. Um, everyone and every ability has a right to participate in strengthening their community. When I talk about community, community is a term that you use in ecology. In ecology, a community is an aggregate of various species of organisms and the habitat that they live in. And when one part of that community is weakened, the entire community is weakened. And the stronger you can help make every portion of a community, the stronger that community is and the stronger you are. And you have more and more to give back. So we strive to be inclusive, and we believe that everyone has access to, um, to food, and we embrace hope and community, volunteerism, gratitude, sovereignty, sustainability, and above all else, we operate with a lot of passion. <laughs> and a lot of giggling, Judy. <laughs> I have a picture of coming up of you, and you, I think, well, anyway, there's a lot of giggling at the field, and you'll see it. <laughs> so I want to take a few seconds um, to go through some of the faces of our volunteer. We have an amazing, dedicated group of people who, from day one, um, almost five years ago, have been coming back uh, over and over. If not now, when? If not, who? Me. And every single person who has volunteered and become part of this organization embodies that. And I <laughs> feel very strongly about that. This is uh, actually a shot from the Medway site. And it took about three weeks to do the, f the initial. It's a, it's a small site. It's about 30 by 50. Um, but there was a lot of just backbreaking work to get through to do this, to prepare this whole site. And this was the victory shot at the end of that day. And I, I love that shot. No, they're not in a cage. <laughs> <laughs> so Terrascape's uh, landscape design, uh, almost from the very beginning, has donated the service of our gardening team um, to help out at the farm one day a week. And um, so we get a lot of youthful, energetic, strong, <laughs> um, great young people uh, out there that this is the favorite part of their job is getting to come to the farm versus doing um, some of the work that we do, but they had just finished uh, constructing some permanent cucumber trellises. Um, so that was a huge, huge coup for us, and they were very proud of themselves. Broad forking. <laughs> uh, so Courtney was a employee for Terrascape's landscape design, and she served as our assistant farm manager for a number of years, and she is now down in Brooklyn as farm manager at... I remember the name of the farm, but it is a very big, very old nonprofit farm that does very similar work. And she's now off running the show herself down in Brooklyn. And she is amazing, and we miss her <laughs> and her energy and her broad forking every day. <laughs> so as I said, we had some very humble beginnings. And um, we you can see in the field, in the slide, this is an aerial shot um, found this on Google Maps from 2019. And uh, some of the soil here, it's very sandy soil. Uh, and it was it's also very um, nutrient poor. So we've been trying to build this up with cover crops over the past few years. And uh, we will continue to work on the soil health in this area. Uh, but this whole field, there's no electricity out there, and there is no running water. There's no spigot to turn on, and there's no plug to plug into. And to get to the field, there is a very lovely um, walk uh, through some nature trails. Uh, so everything that comes in and out of the field, it comes down that trail. Uh, you'll see our trusty gorilla cart. <laughs> 
<laughs> we have three of them now. <laughs> we also have a motorized one now. Um, but there, um, there were no, um, there was no shade. Um, we, the former farmer had left some fairly flimsy um, but Rubbermaid storage sheds, which, thank God, we had those. They really helped protect our gear for the first year, but we definitely needed a little bit of, of infrastructure. So this is Memorial Day of 2020, and we marched out into the middle of that field, and I laid down a corner stake, and I said, let's go 100 yards this way and 100 yards that way. We're making a square. Um, in preparation for that, though, Kathy Martin, who is not able to be here tonight, but she is um, our treasurer, uh, she had thrown herself into researching electric fences. She didn't know anything about electric fences and all of a sudden I had a work plan on my desk to create this electric fence and she went out and bought the supplies. Uh, and so, <laughs> you know, it seems like, oh, we went out into the field and we built an electric fence. It took a lot to get there um, and, and, and we did it. Um, so we had a weed eater, we had a lawnmower, and we had a pole driver and uh, we did rent a rototiller. You'll hear us uh, talk about being reduced tillage and, and working to no-till, but uh, we do need to um, use some mechanical assistance from time to time, and we do it as carefully and as gently as, as possible when we need to use a tiller. Uh, that first year, in order to, because as I said, we are all volunteer. We are not there every single day, all day, um, and so we need to find ways where we can actually manage the work that we're taking on. And so the first year, we victoriously purchased this beautiful weed fabric. <laughs> and it was a lifesaver. It was an absolute lifesaver. Um, but we are all committed to trying to transition ourselves away as much as possible for any sort of petroleum-based product to use on the farm. And um, we, we can't do it all at once, but we work towards that. That's a goal and that's a value and that always guides our decisions. So when we have a choice of doing something without plastic, we can make that choice because we know where our hearts are centered in this work. But in the first year, we, we triumphantly got that weed fabric out there and we happened to have some extra cabbage seedlings growing and we got them planted. And we... Uh, set up an irrigation system. Um, none of us were irrigation specialists, but we figured out how to um, get a water pump, um, hook up a whole framework of delivery lines and and distribution lines and emitter lines and all sorts of crazy, wonderful stuff. And we have worked from that time to transition away from using the speed fabric um, in Future years, our fields um, today really look more like this. We haven't, we haven't rolled out row cover since uh, year two, um, and only at the beginning of year two. By the end of year two, the uh, rows we were creating, um, we were um, switching over to using mulch and just um, had acquired a few more tools, a few more scuffle hose and fire hose, Nancy's favorite, the Delta hoe. <laughs> <laughs> And um, so a little progression of, of how we were able to establish ourselves and then keep working towards farming in the way we really, really want to be. So ecological farming, Loring did a good job explaining that. And I just want to add that as part of a community, everything that we do affects the community around us, as I, I said that earlier, but uh, now take that concept and apply it to the farm itself. A lot of people, when they refer to their homes and their backyards, and they say, the woods around my house, the park down the street, I, we can say the, the native uh, you know, ecosystem around our farm, but the farm is part of that system. And everything we do on that farm is done within that system. So we have been practicing cover, cover cropping. 
which me and I'll show you some pictures of that to, to give you a little better idea of what that actually means. Um, building healthy and resilient soils, reducing tillage, transition from plastic culture. Um, we invite nature to participate. We you'll we have lots of flowering plants around our farm. We interplant as much as possible. Um, you'll see, you know, Swiss chard, and then you'll see a bunch of flowers growing at the base of it um, to help with insect control and all sorts of things. And biodiversity. Diversity is stability in any uh, ecological system. The more diverse it is, the more stable it is. So cover cropping. <laughs> Here, Judy. <laughs> Judy and Nancy, oh, that's Susan in the picture, okay. Um, <laughs> these are some of our little cover crop seeds germinating. Plant them very, very thickly. They come up very quickly and they form a dense cover. They help suppress the weeds underneath them. Uh, and then we use different cover crops for different reasons. I'll plant buckwheat because it will mine deep down into the subsoil and pull phosphorus up. We plant things in the legume family because they generate microbial associations that take nitrogen out of the air and make it bioavailable to plant's root systems. Um, so every cover crop has a reason for being used, and we use different combinations of these plants throughout the season. And some cover crops we use because we can also harvest them at the end of the year and eat them, such as daikon radish. <laughs> and I think one of the, the biggest uh, advances we've been able to make is really secure a great source of hay. And when I say hay, I mean hay. <laughs> Um, we work with a man who farms very high quality feed hay for livestock and he sells us his old stale hay for four dollars a bale. We buy 50 bales at a time. Because it's stale, that means the seed heads are dead in it. And it also means that it didn't come from some hay field that had been neglected. So there's no, there are no weed seeds. There's no multi-flora rows. There's no um, bind or black swallow. Uh, so, and we put this down very thickly, and we probably, at this point, we've built up enough microbial activity in parts of our field where we have to apply mulch twice a year, which is amazing. People will see me in the fall pulling out wooden stakes saying, yes, yes, because it's totally eaten and degraded. And that's what we want to see. We want to see, if we've put organic matter in that soil, we want to see that it's being broken down. The first year, at the end of the year, when I was pulling out some of our wooden stakes, they were almost pristine. <laughs> so we're, we're working for more, um, more resilient life in the soil. Our process is broad fork. So we always go into an area, we broad fork, we do this a couple of times a year, um, and then we will tilt the soil. So this is a little tiny baby mantis rototiller, but it literally turns over the top two inches of soil, and that's it. It just smooths it out so we can get in there and plant. Um, and then we plant. There's Rona. Hi, Rona. <laughs> and we mulch. And we actually are transitioning into broad fork tilth mulch and then plant because you can do the, these, get all your weeds under control and get a thick layer of mulch down. Even if you're not going to plant for two or three weeks, get that mulch down and plant, plant into it. And then you're not fighting weeds. Because with your volunteer time, <laughs> the last thing we want to do is waste time or have to do something over again. So we're always looking to evaluate, reevaluate, and strategize. How do we become more efficient? What mistakes did we make? How can we do things better? Cover cropping. <laughs> so here are some of our cover crops. Um, these are called cocktails. You'll hear farmers talk about their cover crop cocktail. They put down a mixture of cover crop seeds instead of just one type. Um, so it's not just a straight-up shot of uh, buckwheat. We've got a, uh, a cosmopolitan of um, oats, buckwheat, and daikon radish here. Um, we also do, and uh, crimson clover, 
and these make amazing bee pastures. I posted a picture of this on Instagram, and this farmer that I follow in North Dakota, I almost fell on my face. She commented that we had a lovely bee pasture. I thought that was the best compliment I think we've, I've ever received <laughs> um, because she's an amazing farmer. And so these, are, these plants are feeding the soil, but they're feeding our wildlife. And they're, they're changing the soil biology, and they're just making our lives richer. Um, this area will be planted next year. We did three successions of cover crops in this portion of the field um, between the fall of 22, the spring of 23, and the fall of 23, and all different combinations. And this section of the field was that first um, 100 by 100 foot square that we marked off that first year that grew food intensively for the first three years and so we gave it a nice rest and now it's going to go back to work for us and we'll put another portion of the field into cover crops um, this coming year what well, we actually already have because they were seeded in the fall so we're always encouraging our beneficial organisms to help us and most of those beneficial organisms are insects, um, although birds, skunks, have given us a huge in the past. Uh, we had the second, the spring of the second year, we had this um, June beetle, and it was maybe the first or second occurrence that Massachusetts has seen ever. It's an it's a insect pest that's coming up from the south, and we had a huge outbreak of it, and it ate all of our peppers that we'd planted that year. It was a very bad year. Um, and the grubs are the biggest, if you've ever seen lawn grubs, the, lawn, the grub for the June beetle is like a Japanese beetle grub <laughs> times 15. They are enormous. <laughs> um, we did inoculate the soil with beneficial nematodes, so we put a lot of microbes to work for ourselves. Um, I use a lot of beneficial nematodes to, to eat things like grubs. Uh, but the other thing we found is the skunks had gotten into the field. We came in one day, and you saw the little nose marks. And they had eaten. The next year, we didn't have any June beetles emerge from the soil. It was amazing. Uh, but we're always trying to encourage um, the, the wildlife to come in and help us. We plant rows of flowers in between. If they're beautiful. We can share them with people. But they also just give back and back. Um, and we're also trying to exclude <laughs> pests instead of spraying chemicals on them to kill them. And, you know, we didn't just have all of these things to begin with. We've identified problems and then tried to figure out the most ecologically sustainable way to deal with them. This insect netting price per inch is exorbitant. And a lot of farms um, that, are, that need to sell their crop to make a living and support themselves um, don't employ this type of exclusion because it's too expensive. And we have decided that this type of farming is actually more critical to what we do. And so um, when we do our fundraising, people love to say, well, you're all nonprofit and you're all volunteers, so what do you need money for? Um, we do try to invest in, in equipment that um, makes the work that we do put in as volunteers more and more effective. This was actually, this whole story about this insect e exclusion and the pepper plants that it's uh, protecting could be an entire lecture in and of itself, but this helped us solve a massive problem that we had that the, the year after the June beetles, the next year we lost our entire pepper harvest to pepper maggots, <laughs> which is a, a tiny fly that lays its eggs on the peppers and the, the eggs hatch inside the pepper and they eat the pepper from the and you have all these beautiful peppers formed. Right as they start to ripen is when seem to do their worst work. <laughs> so you have peppers growing. We had 500 pepper plants in the field watching all these beautiful peppers ripen. And then they started to turn color. And then they just turned to mush. Disgusting. <laughs> um, but when I went to research how to deal with this organically, there was nothing online. I, I, by extension service or anything that talked about non-toxic, non-chemical ways to deal with this pest. 
So I researched its life cycle and we figured out how to work to exclude it. And we had the most gorgeous pepper harvest that I I've ever seen this year. We sent about 350 pounds of peppers to food pantries this year, which was amazing. So we're always trying to um, work on projects and problems like this. Boom. You know, sometimes when you're done with a crop, um, it, the, it's tempting to, to pull the whole thing out and make room and put a new crop in. We do a lot of succession planting, yes, but we also allow certain things to remain in the ground and bloom. Uh, these were actually some onions that had escaped harvest the year before, and they started sprouting in the spring, and it was just a small patch. So we left them, and they, they're they absolutely covered with pollinators. Um, this is a broccoli. If you've ever let broccoli go to seed and watched the myriad diverse array of pollinators on broccoli flowers, it's, it's dizzying and amazing. Um, the chicory, uh, same thing, and um, the fennel. Uh, so we, we do let a few things bloom. We don't let entire rows go to seed. We, we do turn rows over to do succession planting, but we leave pockets here and there to make sure that our insect pollinators and our beneficial insects have little habitats all over the field. So we also, <laughs> people say, well, what do you do in the winter? <laughs> well, we're always planning for the, for the next growing season. Um, but we get out to the field uh, as often as we can, and um, we have worked for a few years to pull bittersweet and multiflora rows out. Now, this is, some people think, a fool's errand. Uh, I think it's good exercise, um, and it's also <laughs> a self-fulfilling prophecy, and you have job security, the whole nine yards. But, um, but... You know, now we're dealing with smaller bittersweet vines rather than these great big, uh, huge ones. These beautiful, this is just a, a whole line of the most magnificent white pine trees you've ever seen. And we just hope they're a little bit happier. Um, we will be planting native plants in, in place of the invasive plants and we'll be helping steward those, um, continuing to pull more uh, multiflora, uh, glossy buckthorn, and bittersweet are the three worst invasive plants that we have there. But we're, we're working on this area and just helping to try to tilt the balance more towards the native um, plants that belong there. And it's just great fun to get out there in the winter. And then we usually see Mike snowshoeing <laughs> around the field. <laughs> Uh, we have been um, having our eye on trying to grow uh, plants throughout the winter. Uh, since we started, we've, we've tried several different iterations of this and honing the methodology of how to get this. Uh, so this is what setting up for winter growing might look like in the fall. You want to get your hoops in the ground before the ground freezes, lesson number one. Um, <laughs> And you want to find a way to securely attach the covering, lesson number two, three, four, and five. Um, and then in January, about three weeks ago, I took this picture. Um, I looked underneath, and we have beautiful little, that's escarole, but we have several other types of plants. We have spinach coming. We have little kohlrabis. Um, so... This is an amazing thing for us to sort of finally crack that nut. And, um, you know, once we crack a nut, we never go, we, we don't look back. We just, we just keep, we keep going. We say, great, now we can do that. Let's get on to the next thing. What do we need to do next? Um, so this was amazing. This was triumphant. This is kind of a very insignificant looking picture, but when you realize what it represents, plus a squirrel is just yummy. <laughs> and... Not a bad shot of how beautiful and magical uh, the field is. So a uh, few improvements for 2023. We got some wheels. Um, we, we did get a little two-wheel walk-behind tractor and some implements uh, that help us around the farm. 
and a huge coup is actually getting this trailer. Um, and we're now able to, uh, we have a scale where we can do better record keeping to keep track of the food that we're growing. Loring had mentioned that um, we are shifting our focus of the food that we grow. Every year we, with our food pantries, um, we keep in close contact. We, we deal with four food pantries and we want to make sure we're growing the food that their clients need and that their clients um, would like. Uh, we have incredibly culturally diverse clients at all of these different food pantries. Um, many of them are people who have just immigrated to this country in their lifetime. Um, and many more of them are people whose parents immigrated here and they were, they were born here. But when you go to our grocery stores and you <laughs> are from you know, South America and you go to our grocery stores and you're looking for anything that looks familiar, you will not find it. Um, so we do a lot of research into uh, finding the crops that are culturally important and trying to grow them. And for a long time, we've wrestled with this idea of how many pounds, how many pounds, how many pounds, how many pounds of food have you donated? And it's important. It is important to, you know, fill bellies and get calories on plates. That is critical. Um, but it is also critical to feed who people are at the core, uh, who they are uh, as, you know, who, what their heritage is, what their culture is. And so that means that moving forward, we'll be um, dedicating more of our growing space to growing uh, foods that, that do fulfill that cultural relevance. A lot of these foods are actually more nutrient dense than um, some of the foods we have been growing in the past. They don't weigh as much. <laughs> so, you know, I just challenge everyone to, you know, just think about um, how we value the food that we're growing. So, um, all right, crop selection. So we usually are letting the food pantries tell us what And because we all at heart are horticulturists, we're happy to know that that they need a whole bunch of different things because it's fun to grow a lot of different things. Um, but we are focusing on nutrient-dense foods. Swiss chard is actually a huge hit um, at most food pantries. They love to get it. Um, kale is also, I know there's probably a lot of mixed feelings about kale, uh, but that's okay. Um, collards, a uh, huge, huge demand for collards. We did three rows of collards this year, and I think next year we'll do five. I, I, I don't think we could grow enough collards. Um, so, and cabbages. <laughs> we grow, we're really good at growing cabbage. We love cabbage, and cabbage is well received, so it's a great fit for us. <laughs> um, other nutrient dense foods, we also tripled, tripled or quad tripled the amount of garlic we grew this year. We planted three times as much as we planted last year. Um, we're going to be growing more and more carrots. I think the first year we did one row of carrots and the next year we did two rows of carrots. You know, next year, I think if we do seven or eight rows of carrots, we can't go wrong. Um, so really streamlining and honing. Here's some, here's our daikon radishes. This was our cover crop turned, uh, turned uh, dinner and um, Okay, so some, <laughs> what? Oh. <laughs> so one of the stars of the show is actually here in the back. He's very humble. <laughs> He's very humble. Um, but we did tackle some infrastructure um, projects because as we did acquire some equipment, um, we needed a place to sa store it safely um, instead of our basements. Um, and that two-wheel tractor, uh, beautiful, beautiful piece of machinery. Um, so we needed a place to house this. And Nancy <laughs> had um, ties to a carpenter who um, she just spoke so passionately uh, and lovingly about what we do. He donated uh, all of his time to come and direct uh, two days of building both a shed and a pavilion, and it was an old-fashioned barn raising. It was an amazing experience. We had about 25 people there, 
uh, working in two sites and Eldon sort of maestroing the whole show. And, um, and we did, we built this shed in one day. And at the same time, I'll show you the other structure that we almost completed the building of in, in um, two days, we built these structures. These are considered temporary structures. They do not have poured foundations. Um, so they, they are movable. Um, and they are fairly low low impact. But so that was our shed. There's Andy in the red. Hi, Andy. Stand up. Take a bow. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and the um, the pavilion. Uh, back a few slides, you saw a picture of a little tent that would all huddle underneath when it rained and try to get our buckets of food underneath and pull the lawnmower underneath and you know and when when the sun would come up it would actually shine underneath and you'd be standing under the tent you'd have to step outside of the tent uh, behind it to actually be in the shade um, so we did need some protection and this also was built uh, in in that two-day work session and this has been uh, an amazing thing and once we had that in place we said, hmm, you know, this is this is great. Look at this roof capturing water. Um, we are protected by the Good Samaritan law for the produce that we send to food pantries because it's just donated. And that means we don't have to wash it. Uh, we could send dirty, ragged lettuce um, to the food pantry and uh, a, a working farm that is charging money for their produce has to adhere to very strict standards set forth by the Department of Health and the US Department of Agriculture and the state agriculture. And we decided that even though we were covered by the Good Samaritan law, that it was not okay to send dirty food to the food pantries. And we decided that we wanted to be able to wash that food. And that means you have to have a certified wash station. So. I sent half of our crew off to <laughs> training. Uh, Cornell University had a two-day uh, food safety handling course. Um, I was able to take a course through the Mass Department of Agriculture and get certified within the state of Massachusetts for safe food handling. So we have about six people um, at the farm who are fully trained with all of the best practices for safe food handling. So. I mean, then of course we need a wash station. So <laughs> we, but again, we have no electricity and we have no running water. So how do we do that? So we, um, I worked with Eldon, our carpenter, and we devised a very cool system that will capture water from the roof. We have rain barrels now. And I found this, 12 volt water purification system that you can take water out of a swamp and have a perfectly clean uh, cup of water to drink when it comes out. And it also uh, includes a pump that pumps water um, at five gallons a minute, which your sinks are about two and a half gallons a minute. So we, and it's powered by a battery and the battery is charged by a beautiful solar panel that was donated to us by Amoresco. Amoresco sent, um, has sent uh, several of their workers out to volunteer at the field, including some engineers that came out to install the solar panel and hook it up and uh, make sure it works. Um, so partnerships, partnerships, partnerships are incredibly important and we're always um, very strategically thinking about uh, creating more partnerships, our partnerships with the church, our partnerships with our food pantries, with each other, uh, with corporations in the area. We've had um, IPM Corporation, Amoresco, Terrascapes, a few other corporations have sent people out to help in the field. These are <laughs> some of our corporate partners, <laughs> some of our corporate work days. Uh, and yes, they all get to board fork. <laughs> <laughs> In case you're wondering, <laughs> if you really want to try broad forking, do not worry. <laughs> Just come on out. 
So that first year, our food pantry partners, uh, Open Table Maynard and the um, the Medway site, feeds uh, puts food into the Medway Community Farms donation to the Medway Village Food Pantry. So we had two food pantry partners that year. The Medway Village pan Food Pantry also supports a woman's shelter, which is another um, incredibly important cause to us. And Nancy actually worked in um, in a, a parallel um, food pantry garden that grew specifically for that woman's shelter um, for about a year. Judy, I think you worked in that garden too. Uh, so... Oh, in 2022, we uh, made a partnership with the Sudbury Community Food Bank, which was very important to us. And this past year, we have added a fourth food pantry, La Collaborativa, in Chelsea, um, who are far way, way more than a food pantry. They are an entire community support organization, um, but they also uh, have a food pantry and an incredible story that I can't really get into or do justice, but... Um, so we now have four food pantry partners, and um, we will probably cap it at that and just work on being able to grow more for them and really tailor what we're growing to their specific needs. We have lots of pictures of produce, so <laughs> I'm just going <laughs> to um, flip through a few pictures just because... Mike Manent uh, was just an amazing volunteer from Open Table. He came um, every single week. He would be waiting for us in the parking lot with his boxes uh, ready to scurry all of our produce back to Open Table. And all of our food pantry partners actually uh, have arranged for ways to come get the food from us. The first year, we were really scrambling to try to put the time in at the field and then go someone pack up their car and and drive all the way up to Maynard. So we've really um, been lucky to work that all out. And we are starting to grow more of these culturally diverse um, diverse plants. This wakatai uh, on your left is an incredibly important herb throughout Central and South America. And Carrie Wager um, <laughs> has made a very interesting blog post about this. And um, so if you go to our website, you can read about it. <laughs> uh, but these are just some of the, um, the foods that we've been growing. We grow ginger. Um, we grow lemongrass. We grow turmeric. Um, all sorts of cool things. Sesame. Sesame is a beautiful plant. It smells great. It tastes good. And, um, and it's just a really, really good plant to grow. Uh, this year, we're starting to grow mushrooms, <laughs> so um, we ended up with a windfall of wood chips, and um, I won't go into details, but we scooped up as many as we could, as fast as we could, which did take all summer. Uh, <laughs> it wasn't very fast, um, but we've inoculated a large patch of them with wine cap mushrooms, and we'll do another inoculation in the spring, so we should get a full season of mushroom production out of that, so we're excited to try that, and the food pantries are all really excited for us to try this. Um, I'm not sure why, but mushrooms are a big hit. Uh, we have also started uh, growing and donating um, dried culinary herbs, and these are herbs of some of the very specialty plants. So, for instance, this is called um, Mexican oregano, and this is, this is not Greek oregano. This is a different genus and species entirely. And when you see a lot of recipes in Mexican cuisine calling for oregano, what they're actually calling for is this. But most um, people from Mexico who have come to this country have adapted to just use Greek oregano. It's very, very different. <laughs> this is a great plant. Um, and I invite you to uh, come up and take a look at that at the end. So some of the initiatives working on as we move forward is growing food for food pantries, but also looking for ways that we as an organization can contribute to the strength of our food system. And sometimes that means providing research that can inform any, anyone trying to grow food in our region on how to do that better. So we actually conduct variety trials. We will um, 
work with various partners to do that or just come up with variety trials on our own. Uh, this is a basal variety trial and um, Rutgers University has been developing basal that is resistant to downy mildew for several years. And so we are actually growing this in conjunction with their research team and just providing, at this point, they just want feedback, like did it survive, did it get downy mildew? Um, but being able to contribute that knowledge into uh, research that's providing better varieties that don't need chemical inputs, that don't need extra fertilizers, that can just grow better in our region. Um, we're participating in some uh, tomato breeding projects. So, <laughs> very tasty breeding project. Um, and yes, one of them is going to be named Dizzy. I may or may not have had something. Uh, so, seed saving and seed sharing. So, we also recognize how privileged and how lucky we are to be able to do the work that we do and to have so much support for doing it that we feel it's time to start leveraging some of the resources that we have. Um, we have been growing seeds on the farm uh, for the past couple of years and saving them. And so now we're going to start sharing those seeds at food pantries. Um, we will be um, sharing seeds also with local libraries. But um, this is kale. We have some kale seeds that uh, carry. There's a whole blog post on this too, isn't there? or at least an Instagram post. Um, this is kale, we, it overwintered, we let it flower, took the, Carrie took the seed heads home, cleaned them up, we had beautiful kale seeds, we got them packaged, labeled from Aurelia's garden, with love, to yours. <laughs> uh, so we're starting to share some of the resources that we have. We'll be growing seedlings for the food pantry, um, tomatoes, eggplants, peppers, things like that. Um, we've been sending um, potted herbs that we've been growing. We just sent potted herbs last week to two different food pantries, a ton of cilantro and a ton of dill. Um, so we'll be sending things like that. Um, and in all, we also just want to share um, how we have done what we do in order to support other entities, groups, organizations, um, gaggle of geese, whoever wants to try to do this. Um, we want to share what we've learned um, and try to uh, provide some mentorship. We'll be building out resources that people can freely access from our website or just contacting us. We've, we've met with other food, food pantries and other organizations. We met with the um, Greater Quabbin Land Trust. Uh, they wanted to start a food pantry garden. We've met with them a few times to help mentor them. We've worked with um, Damien's Kitchen down in Wareham uh, to try to help them. They want to establish a food pantry garden. So um, we want to thank Mike. <laughs> um, he's our number one supporter and being able to farm on his land is, it's not just a privilege, it's just a very, very special thing. And I think the, the more we're there, the more connected we feel to that piece of property. And, and um, you know, we know every little hill and dip and we remember when that hole happened three years ago and, you know, and um, you just, you, you know the land and, and, um, and you form a very deep relationship with it. And so, Mike, thank you for allowing us the, just the, this opportunity to, to take care of it. <laughs> this is my favorite quote from Nancy. <laughs> Do you want me to read it? Okay. <laughs> I'm like, is it too small? As we survey our fields today, which have tripled in size, we can only imagine what these magic fields bordered by flaming maple trees and majestic pines will bring forth in the next growing season. 
All right, so we have another QR code that will take you to our website if you want. We have pamphlets up front, and we are ecstatic to take questions if we have time. I know we went over. Thank you, everyone, for your patience and for sticking with us. So that is a wonderful question. Um, that winter rye was a cover crop put down by the previous farmer. And when we broke ground uh, that, that spring, uh, we really did just till it into the ground. However, <laughs> since then, we have been working with small grains and researching different varieties of wheat and barley and oats. Um, that we can get to grow as a cover crop and then also harvest and use the grains. And we're working with um, an organization down in southeast Massachusetts called Freed Seed Federation who has seed cleaning equipment. Uh, that's one of the missing pieces is when you harvest that grain, then you've got to thresh it. And when you thresh it, then you have to winnow it. And if you're going to grow enough of it to be make a meaningful donation, that's a lot, and you're not going to just do that in your living room. So you need to be able to do that with um, with a larger piece of equipment. So we're actually I will be taking um, a bunch of it down next Sunday um, <laughs> to to get a bunch of it cleaned. So that's a wonderful question, and yes. <laughs> Fertilizer and rodents. Okay, well, let's talk about voles. <laughs> so, um, Nancy, close your ears. Okay. Uh, rodents are tough, right? We're, they're, they're part of nature, um, but they're also incredibly, incredibly destructive. Um, when So, last year, in 2022, they were at crisis level and so we did put a lot of snap traps out to kill them i'm not going to poison anything i'm not going to put a poison bowl out there that an owl's going to eat we're, we're not going to do any of that but but we did put a lot of snap traps out and i have i did a lot of changing out of those traps you, you have to maintain them and they're not cheap. They are cheap. To a lot of people, they're cheap. But, you know, to us, we're a little nonprofit, and, you know, I'm going to reuse that trap. Um, <laughs> so because that was so horrific, um, one thing that we worked on this year, and, Nancy, we didn't set a single trap this year, by the way, um, is we worked on more strategic placement of our mulch. So learn what your rodents are using to get to the plants that they're trying to destroy and take that away. Now, we do, we left our mulch in place, but um, clearing out overgrowth, you know, when I say we leave plants to bloom, that doesn't mean you just let them grow all over the place and make a huge mat on the ground that the voles are going to move into. So you, you just want to be strategic and maintain those areas. And um, no, we did not set a single trap to hurt a, mole, a vole this year. Um, fertilizer. So... Uh, I really steer away from anything that calls itself fertilizer. We feed the soil. We provide those cover crops where the roots are in the ground doing their work. We leave roots in place. When we harvest, when we clean out a row to plant a new crop in it, we cut the plants off at the base. And we remove the tops. But the root system, so a plant's root system goes into the ground, and as the plant is photosynthesizing and making all these delicious sugars, it's feeding the soil. It's exuding all these wonderful things out in the soil, and it's just cultivating its own garden under the surface of the soil of microbes. And those microbes are bacteria, they're fungus, they're amoebas, they're nematodes, and they all have a function. Some are cycling nutrients in one direction, some are cycling nutrients in another direction, and they're all feeding that plant. And those, those roots actually stay alive for quite a long time after you cut the top of that plant down. So they've been working all season <laughs> creating this 
hidden life under the soil. Um, and we plant our new seedlings in right beside the old plants. It helps with spacing too. You don't have to respace the rows. <laughs> um, and the new plants will grow very vigorous vigorously because they're able, their little roots are able to find the roots that are already down in there and they meet up with each other and they, so we're really, we really try to figure out how to feed the plants so the plants can feed the soil and the soil will feed the plants. We do microbial inoculations. I spray um, things on the leaves of the plants, little mi microbes that help the plants photosynthesize. Um, microbes that actually help the plant defend itself from diseases. Some of these microbes can actually fend off um, funguses and other types of diseases. So we're really starting to do more and more of that. Um, so, and doing a lot less of fertilizing. I'll put down amendments. We'll put down some biochar. We'll put down kelp meal. Um, we'll put down green sand. Um, things like that, and those are all substrates that give those microbes something to work with in the soil. Uh, we really try very hard not to go to the store and get a bag of a fertilizer that was made in a factory by some, you know, process that, you know, some inorganic nitrogen and inorganic this and inorganic that and take it out and throw it on the field. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Yeah, we didn't even mention the seedlings. We grow every single seedling. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Yeah. Oh, yes, we could do a whole presentation on that. <laughs> yes. <laughs> oh, well, we should do a seed saving lecture at some point. Um, it depends on how you keep them. Um, but you have to keep them cold and dry. And most seeds will keep for three to five years. Uh, some will keep much, much longer. Bye, Mike. Thank you for coming. Thank you. Um, parsnips, uh, onion, and um, carrot seeds are the least long-lived because the seed coat's very soft and it can get damaged easily. But most, like brassica seedlings, will seeds will live for 15, 20 years. No pro and actually, some of these, there are tomato seedling packets in here. Um, that was seed that I grew in 2017, and I did a germination test on it, and some of it still has 94% germination rate. So, yeah. Same thing. Same thing. Any other questions online or? Fish emulsion. Fish emulsion. Oh, yes. So, so that's very interesting. Fish emulsion, um, thank you for that question. And fish emulsion goes into the foliar feed that I use to do microbial inoculations on the canopy of plants. So that's a whole mixture of molasses and liquid humates and fish emulsion and kelp emulsion and um, I said molasses. Uh, yes, so fish emulsion is great. It also makes a great root drench. So that's the other thing we've started to do is um, as we bring those hundreds and hundreds and thousands of seedlings from our homes to plant in the field, <laughs> um, we've started making big tubs of a mixture of microbes and fish emulsion and um, just dipping those, uh, the little seedlings, giving them a little root drench and then in the, in the ground. So we're gonna just start doing more and more and more of that. You know, once we've figured out how to do it and, it, and the method's set up, then we just need to, okay, we're just gonna do this today. And you pull all the pieces and, it, and it's there. So yes, fish emulsion is wonderful. <laughs> Judy. <laughs> oh. <laughs> There's something very, very grounding, literally, but also spiritually about working your hands in the soil. That's one thing. I know that I will, no matter what, how I felt when I arrive, I'm going to feel better when I leave because of that, because of the, the great conversations. And because I'm a gardener, 
I'm learning every single session that I go to from these fabulous gardeners, from Hannah and other volunteers who know much more than I do. So if you have an interest in just beyond, besides doing good, but doing good for yourself, whether you're an experienced gardener or a novice, I highly recommend coming out and learning and enjoying. And this really was not solicited. <laughs> There's cookies up front. <laughs> yeah, I mean, above all else, we really, community is one of our number one values. And the community of volunteers that we have are, is, we, we can't say one community is more important than another, but the community of volunteers is, is a family. And we, there's always room at the table for one more family member. So we would love to have more people come out and join us in the field. Um, we could use the help for sure, but we also just love getting to know new people. Um, Carol is one of our newest volunteers and she's come out regularly all fall and it's just, it's just been wonderful having you join us and, and become a regular and, um, and, and we love that. So thank you. Yes, please grab our newly minted brochure. We're very proud of this. We're all grown up.